догнать пацана, посчитать потери Суммы нули, погибать на сцене Снова один, прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Эй, эй, как там рад Правда назад, на черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, стель на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Так дать пацана, посчитать потери Суммы нули, погибать на сцене Снова один, прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Правда назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Эти понты покупались во рту, твои мозги затупились к утру. Так дайте пацанам посчитать потери, суммы нули погибают на сцене. Снова один прогуляюсь без тени, заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее. Э, э, как там рад, правда назад, черный каскад. Вижу твой взгляд, стерн на гаяк, мог тебя взять, но ты не моя. Так дайте пацанам посчитать потери, суммы нули Снова один, прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Э, э, как там рад Правда назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяк Мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Так дайте пацана посчитать потери Суммы нули погибают на сцене Снова один прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Э, э, как там рад Правда назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя Так дайте пацана посчитать потери Суммы нули погибают на сцене Снова один прогуляюсь без тени Заливаю лит, поцелуй на шее Э, э, как там рад Назад, черный каскад Вижу твой взгляд, степь на гаяр Не мог тебя взять, но ты не моя What we do have time for, though, is this clip from JT just telling someone how wrong they are when they step up to ask a simple question during a recent town hall. One is to ask, uh, one is about Ukraine and First Russia. of all, what's your name? My, oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Michael. Canada is traditionally known for advocating for peace. Uh, I know we are a member of NATO, but I know we don't have a nuclear weapon. Why has your government failed to uh, draft a peace proposal to end this war in Ukraine. I'm gonna have to call you out, Michael. You're completely wrong about the war in Ukraine. It is not a proxy war between the United States and Russia right now. That's Russian propaganda and disinformation. My job is to call that stuff out. Right. Yeah, and see, that's why people are angry. Because of that dude right there and his attitude. Um, what else do I have for you? I do want to absolutely talk about Gonzalo Lira, journalist. He was jailed in Ukraine. I think he was in jail for some nine weeks. For what? He was. He's been critical of the war. He's been critical of the Ukrainian regime, critical of NATO, critical of Biden, critical of the U.S. government's position on this, and uh, by extension, critical of Canada. 
Because it is a freaking war. It's not even just a proxy war. It's worse than that. It's an attempt to implement regime change in Russia, in my view. It goes much further than just a proxy war. Now, here's Gonzalo Lira. He has been released from prison. And at last word, uh, he's been he's on his way about to cross the border into Hungary. Where he's seeking asylum. Even though he's been told not to leave Ukraine, he's escaping. He's on, on the road out of there. Here's He's posted uh, a series of videos and he posted a long thread on Twitter, which I actually, I'm not, I'm not very active on Twitter, but I did actually post on there. Um, let's, let's hear what he has to say. I could sit here and talk about it, but I'll give you just a, a short clip from his video. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> I hope you've had a good time. I didn't have such a good time. I spent uh, nine and a half weeks in prison here in Ukraine. Uh, I've been out on bail since uh, July 6th. Today is July 31st. And to prove the time, um, uh, I just checked on my, uh, on my subscription, Defense Politics Asia, which is a pretty good channel, uh, put out, just put out a video called uh, Niger on the Brink of Regional War. That should prove the, the time that I'm recording this video. Mm -hmm. Now, um, at the same time that I'm posting this video, I'm posting a long thread on my Twitter account. My Twitter account is Gonzalo Lira 1968. Gonzalo Lira 1968, one word, all together. And uh, in that, I discuss what has happened to me over the past three months uh, in some detail. I also include the, um, the indictment against me uh, that, um, that I'm going to be tried on. Um, I'm going to be tried on Wednesday, August 2nd, the day after tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Um, I posted both the original Ukraine language version and the uh, translation. The translation was by the court appointed translator, so I have no idea if it's accurate or not. Those who, of you who speak Ukraine will be able to uh, give a better sense as to whether that, um, that translation is accurate, but that's besides the point. I put up the entire indictment in both the original and the translation so that you can see exactly what I was charged with and imprisoned for. Now, the charges are very serious because the penalty is five to eight years in a prison labor camp. Mm. I'm 55 years old. Mm -hmm. And some of you may know, I have a fairly serious heart condition. I'm not going to survive five to eight years. And I've already been told uh, by uh, people who would know that I will be found guilty. And because of circumstances, um, it would be convenient for me to serve out that sentence, for me to basically disappear. Mm -hmm. Disappear in a prison labor camp and, um, you know, potentially die there, you know, either naturally or unnaturally, as the case may be. Now, in the tweet thread, I go into more or less what happened. I composed that tweet thread uh, last night. It took me two hours to do it because there was a lot of information and, uh, you know, keeping it to 25 tweets, you know, it's tough. But anyway, the upshot is that I was accused of um, being a pro-Russian propagandist, and basically, you know, I mean, th cut through the legalese, it was basically that. I was also accused of denying the Russian invasion, which is laughable. I mean, I've always said that the Russians invaded. It's self-evident, you know. I never denied that fact. Uh, they said that I was justifying this invasion that was unprovoked. And of course, we all know that it was provoked. It didn't come out of the blue. It wasn't that the Russians one day decided, hey, let's just invade Ukraine. No, it was provoked. And I gave a very detailed explanation as to why it was provoked in a video that really chapped the ass of the prosecutor's office, apparently. The video of mine called uh, Ukraine a Primer which of course goes into the backstory and the history of relations between these two countries and why they uh, wound up going to war as they are currently embroiled in. So anyway, um, the point is I'm going to be found guilty. And because of things that happened 
corruption and extortion that happened in prison against me, uh, I will be found guilty. I will not get a suspended sentence. I will have to serve out my term and likely die in, in this prison labor camp. The light? Sorry, hang on. <laughs> there you go, Gonzalo. <laughs> Sorry about out that. There, buddy. I don't have three hands. Anyway. Um, so, realizing that's that my good for the heart condition. The tomorrow, exactly. <laughs> and realizing some other information that was quite strange. I was granted bail after innumerable hurdles because when I was originally arrested, I was um, nominally supposed to get a lawyer, have access to a lawyer, be able to call my loved ones and arrange for bail. Now, insofar as lawyers, I have lawyers up the wazoo. Insofar as loved ones, not as many as lawyers, but I have quite a few that I care about very deeply, most especially my small children. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I have two children, Veronica, who is 10. She just turned 10. She turned 10 while I was in prison. And my son, Ramon, who is eight. And of course, I wanted to talk to them, but I was not allowed to speak to them during the entirety of my stay in prison. Um, and of course, I wasn't allowed to post bail, even though I had the means to post bail. Now, let me explain that situation, which is very interesting. You see, nominally, on the first day that I was arrested, I could have posted bail but I was not given the opportunity to do so, to contact the people who would have the cash available to post my bail. And it wasn't that much, it was $11,000, which I, I, I don't want to sound arrogant, $11,000 is quite a bit of money for most people. I am blessed by the good fortune of having the means to put together that kind of money at a moment's notice. And so I could have posted bail on the very first day, but the authorities simply didn't allow me to do it, even though they said I could. Mm -hmm. Now, I was in prison uh, briefly for two nights. I was in interrogatory prison number one. That's the name of it. And then uh, after that, I spent the remaining nine weeks, exactly nine weeks, in CISO prison, which is also an investigative prison. And that is a prison where uh, individuals who have been accused of a crime are held while their case is investigated by either the police or the SBU who has arrested them. The SBU, for those of you who don't know, is the uh, State Security Services of Ukraine. They are basically the, um, the, the, the uh, descendants of the KGB, okay? Uh, so anyway, um, I wasn't allowed to post bail and it was only through fairly heroic measures and a lot of uh, uh, um, pressure, political pressure from the government of Chile and apparently the State Department as well, because they um, didn't seem to like the fact that I wasn't being allowed to post bail. I spoke with representatives of the U.S. Embassy uh, three times during the nine weeks I was there. Um, and uh, they, they didn't, they, they just gave me bromides. They made no effort to uh, pull me out, you know. I mean, if only I'd been a black lesbian druggie or a transgender grifter, then maybe they would have done something. Well, no, if I'd been one of those two things, I would have been out instantly. But of course, since I'm not, yeah, and since uh, a couple of people who would know have told me that Vicky Newland actually knows about me and hates my guts. So there you go. So anyway, the point is, um, there was the appearance of unfairness, so eventually I was allowed to post bail, but the bail conditions were very interesting because um, I had to surrender my passports. I had to wear a electronic monitor. Um, I wasn't allowed to leave the city of Kharkov or the country. And, and so what are you they doing? also confiscated, of course, um, all of my computers, my iPad, my uh, iPhone, uh, they also confiscated uh, about $9,000 that I had as emergency cash, you know, you know, the kind of cash you have around just in case of anything. Well, they confiscated that and, um, and they confiscated a bunch of uh, my documents, specifically my uh, driver's license, my Chilean identity card and the registration cards for my motorcycles. I don't own a car, by the way. 
And so I was told in no uncertain terms that I had to stay sure that in dude. Kharkov and um, <laughs> not leave the city under any circumstances and of course not leave the country. And I would get these this ankle monitor and I would get uh, I would have to surrender my passport. But when I posted bail and was released, uh, I was my passports were returned to me. I didn't get any kind of ankle monitor. And a few days later, I went to the SBU offices of the um, investigator who had uh, you know, investigated my case. And he returned my driver's license, my Chilean ID card, and uh, my registration documents for my motorcycles. As you can see, there's my bike. I don't know if you can see it properly. There you go. And so this was very interesting to me. Now, last year, I was, um, I was detained by the SBU, uh, also for videos that were very critical of what was going on. And um, they investigated me because they thought, curiously enough, that I was some sort of Russian agent. Okay, of course, I'm not a Russian agent, you know. And um, I'm just a regular guy living in Ukraine who saw what was happening, was horrified by this war and thought that the only solution was to sue for peace because it's inevitable. Because if, you know, a, a, um, if a man such as myself, 55 years old, 83 kilos, uh, not in the best of shape, gets in the ring with Mike Tyson in his prime, I mean, we know how it's gonna end, right? Yeah, that was pretty much uh, the, the, the situation insofar as the Ukraine and Russian conflict is concerned. And uh, perhaps I did not emphasize this enough in my videos, but the purpose of my videos was to point out how horrifying the war was, how detrimental to the Ukraine people and the Ukraine nation it was. If the only solution was to find a peace settlement of some sort, of any sort, to prevent the complete destruction of the Ukraine nation and the Ukraine people. Well, that happened. Uh -huh. About a third of the population of Ukraine has left the country. 20% uh, of it is controlled and will be annexed by the Russians. And there's no doubt in my mind that they intend to capture much more territory of the Ukraine nation, probably up to the Dnieper River and take everything east of it. And that will include Odessa, of course. And uh, Ukraine will be broken. It's inevitable at this point, unfortunately. But anyway, the point that uh, I wanted to make is that last year I was detained. I was investigated to see if I was a Russian agent. They realized I wasn't. And uh, I was let go. But I was told in no uncertain terms that I could not leave the city or the country while my case was investigated. And me being a very law-abiding citizen, uh, because the extent of my criminal career up to this point was that in New York City in 2000, in the year 2000, I was living in lower Manhattan, and I had a dog and I would walk the dog without a leash. And one time I got a ticket, $50, which I didn't pay. Uh, that's the extent of my law-breaking career. I'm very much a person who believes in civil society and following the rules and following the law. And so I was told that I couldn't leave the country. I couldn't leave the city even, which I wanted to because I wanted to be near my family. Um, and uh, so I was a good boy. <laughs> Later in prison, in, in CISO, I told this to some, uh, some of the other uh, prisoners there because they're not inmates because none of them have been convicted. Their cases are all being investigated. And some of these investigations take years, plural. Okay. One man I knew had been there for, as he said very proudly, three years and three months. Another had been there six years. Because what they do is that they arrest you and charge you and uh, they start their investigation and they'll get around to the investigation when they get around to it. So a lot of times people just sit there forever. And uh, that's basically the justice system in Ukraine. So anyway, the point is that my case was expedited. Prisoners couldn't believe that my case was uh, investigated in a month, exactly a month. By the 31st of May, they had completed their investigation of me being this uh, evil Russian propagandist. And the indictment was drawn up, which as I said, you can read on, on Twitter and the thread that I posted at the same time that I'm posting this video. 
And uh, where was I? I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, when I was in prison and I told the other prisoners how I had been detained in April of 22 and told in no uncertain terms not to leave the country, uh, the prisoners laughed and they said, you idiot. They were leaving the door open for you to leave. They wanted you to leave, you know, less hassle for them. And me, of course, you know, retrospectively, it's obvious. But at the time, I said, no, I can't do anything. They're telling me to stay, so I must stay, you know, like, a, like an idiot. That's simple as that. So anyway, insofar as my current, uh, 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 you know, status of being out on bail, and the, the judge was very clear that I could, I had to, I mean, it was very explicit. I couldn't leave the city. I couldn't leave the country. And I had to surrender my passport, so I have two, the American and uh, Chilean. And, um, and of course, they also confiscated these documents for my transportation. And yet, when I was released on bail, uh, they gave me all this stuff back. They didn't put the electronic monitor, and uh, they allowed me to keep my passports. And what's more? Okay. Do you want more? <laughs> Do you want more? No. <laughs> Stop talking, Gonzalo, for goodness sake. You know what his problem is? He just talks too much. He has two more posts of equal length. Oh, my God, dude. So just... That's almost an hour's worth of stuff. And in the next one, he actually says that um, this was interesting. I didn't. I haven't watched all of it, but he goes on and says that when he was released the first time, mm -hmm. He should have left the country because when he got arrested again, the prisoners who were in there said, you idiot. They were telling you to get out of the country. They were like opening the door for you. Like, get out of here because you're just a pain in the ass. When even the started, Ukrainian prisoners tell you that, dude, you might want to listen. I'm just <laughs> saying. Bless his heart. He thinks he's still in, in the United States. He thinks he still has freedom of speech. He thinks he still has freedom to travel. He still thinks he has freedom of the press. He's in Ukraine where those things do not exist at all. Anymore. And the law doesn't protect you. And the only reason he's free, and you know and I know, Rick, is because it was getting uncomfortable for the State Department. The State Department was being asked questions about the guy because he does right. have U.S. citizenship. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't a good look. So they told their friends in Ukraine to let him out. And what did they tell him to do? Don't leave the country. And what does he do? Just got to leave the country. He's leaving right. the country. The thing that he should have done like a year That's ago. That's right. Yes, yeah. I would have. I would have got out if I could. Because what are they going to do once you leave the country? They can't arrest you again, right? <laughs> because you've, you're out. Well, he and if you stay, you're screwed. Assange. So yeah. what are you going to do? He should pull a Julian that. Assange and just go, you know, seek asylum in an embassy yeah. somewhere, <laughs> maybe in Moscow. Why is he going to Hungary? <clears throat> Why didn't he just go to yeah. Russia? I mean, oh, Rush is closer. Michael, Michael right is there. asking who the special guest is going to be tonight. I'll let you tell people who the special guest is going to be. But oh, before we do that, before, yeah, before we do that, Scott Ritter apparently mm -hmm. has called out Gonzalo Lira, oh, saying Again. that he is an SBU agent. Yep. What the hell is that? I know it's a little confusing. Those you two have been beefing for months. Give months. me some insight here. I don't understand. <laughs> Let me give you the backstory on that. Um, there's been a Twitter war going on for months now between Gonzalo and Scott. And the last time Gonzalo got himself arrested and released. Now, that was like last April. And, you know, Gonzalo disappeared for two weeks and everybody was worried about him and everyone was asking, is he OK? Is he alive? And Scott was also very concerned about him. But when they released him, Scott found that fishy. And I kind of did too, to be honest with you. Um, and he said, you know, there's only one reason they'd let you go, because you made a deal with them. And I think that's, you know, it was just a, a guess, an educated guess on Scott's part. But I think it's a pretty good guess. Now, obviously, if they did make a deal with Gonzalo, he must have done something to break that deal or piss them off again. Or maybe the SBU arrested him on orders from the United States. That's possible. We don't know. 
Um, but I'm sure he'll tell us because he cannot keep his mouth shut. I mean, the thing about Gonzalo is he never knows when to stop talking. Yeah. Zip it, buddy. You know, but he couldn't resist getting drawn into a Twitter war with Scott. And then that was kind of an unfair debate because Elon kept banning Scott Ritter. <laughs> and so Scott was unable to respond when Gonzalo would attack him on Twitter. Um, now, Scott has since had his Twitter account restored. And now the war continues between him and Gonzalo. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think he's an agent? You think he's working with the SBU, Gonzalo? No, I don't think so. No. Uh, it, what's he got? What does he have to offer them? Unless That's he just shuts question. up, and he can't shut up. So right. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's a, and he hasn't he hasn't said anything. He's been saying is still ne negative. So I no, I don't think so. You know, he claims he has a lawyer. Now, if I were if I were his lawyer, I would give him some advice, some good advice. Shut the fuck up. That's what your lawyer would tell you when you're charged with any crime. You shut the fuck up. Right. Mm -hmm. right. No, I, if I were his lawyer, I'd quit. I'd be like, dude, you just cannot shut up. At least wait until you're safely out of the country across the border in a safe haven and then make your video and tell the whole damn story. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking too. It was like, do you want to get arrested again? Because <laughs> right? like you've got a cell phone with you, they can track it. You're right. sitting there, you're making these long videos. You, he stood there and, mm -hmm. and recorded three videos of that length in that amount of time, they could send a cruiser over and pick you up. Exactly. Like, what the hell? Like, duh. Mm -hmm. I, I got to tell you, I'm constantly amazed at how dumb some of these people who want to do crazy revolutionary things are. <laughs> you and me both, Rick Walker. <laughs>